Derek's story has been called a geek's geek and a photographer's photographer. In addition to being digital media evangelist for O'Reilly Media, he's an author, blogger, editor, speaker, and a photographer whose work has received praise from other world-renowned photographers. Derek is the author of many books on digital photography. In addition, you can follow his work on O'Reilly's digital media site and on his own site, thedigitalstory.com. I think I'm live. Hello out there. I'm Derek Story, and we are going to talk about photography today, and I, I have some just great stuff I want to show you. Now, before I actually get into the presentation, uh, I want to mention a few things to you. One is for, for those of you that have seen me talk before, either live or on lynda.com, you know that I go fairly fast. I'm kind of a fast speaker, and I like to show a lot of pictures quickly. Well, this webinar, because of the technology that we're using, will force me to sort of slow down a little bit. So this, I look at this as an opportunity for personal growth uh, in order to be more, more relaxed during my presentation. So today will be the relaxed version of this talk. And um, I won't tell you that I've already had two cups of coffee, so we'll just uh, sort of bypass that little thing. And what I'm going to show you today are five ways to make your pictures look different than everyone else's. And so why, why would we care about that? Well, I think it's, it's important because photography is, for a lot of us, a form of personal expression, right? I mean, there are millions of photos being taken every day. And uh, that's great. And a lot of them are for personal history and, you know, things that are important to us. But a lot of times we like to share our photos with other people. And I think that when you share your photos with other people, I think there's a part of you that, that wants them to be impressed, that wants them to, to watch and be engaged. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you five little tricks today that you can slip into your slideshows and your snapshots and your photo presentations to other people to make them sort of sit up and take notice uh, of what you're doing. And then, of course, you know, you'll have the usual group shots and someone standing in front of a monument. That's all great, but I tell you, if you've got five or six of these little gems in there, you'll keep their attention during the whole time you're showing the stuff. So let's, let's go into a little bit here. Let me just, I'm in iPhoto. By the way, I'm using iPhoto right now, which is an application that I use a lot for presentation because uh, if, I, if I do want to talk about editing or something, I can kind of slip into edit mode easily and then go back into presentation mode. It's, you know, it's, it's very photographic. But I want to tell you a little bit about who I am first. Uh, I'm Derek Story, and I'm the digital media evangelist for O'Reilly Media. And I have to tell you, it's probably one of the best jobs on earth because basically what I do is things like this. Uh, I also run our digital media site, our website on O'Reilly at digitalmedia.oreilly.com. And I run a virtual camera club called The Digital Story. And uh, how many of you out there are Digital Story uh, listeners? Please raise your hand. And, uh, yeah, I, see, I, I can see a few out there. So uh, The Digital Story, that's where we talk about stuff like this. This is, uh, you know, it's a virtual camera club. Anyone can participate. So, anyway, so everything that you hear and uh, see today, uh, you can probably find on The Digital Story. And also, you don't have to take notes. This is what's so cool about this. You can just sit back. Uh, Enjoy this, have a cold drink or coffee, depending on uh, you know what, what time of day it is where you are right now. Uh, but because all the notes and everything that's going on here uh, are in this book, this is a brand new book called The Digital Photography Companion, and it has all these tips in there. And then also we're going to be sharing, uh, we're recording this, and uh, you'll be able to download it separately. All right, well, let's get to the actual stuff itself. Okay, tip number one. You've heard it a million times, but I'm not sure. It's, for a lot of people, it never really sinks in. The first tip is to get close. Now, I had an old photography teacher. He was great because he would say, okay, you know, what you need to do to get a good shot is you got to get close. And then once you're close, get closer. And, uh, you know, we'd all kind of chuckle and stuff. But the fact of the matter is he was right. He was right. And I'm going to show you some examples of being close and then getting closer. Let's, let's, we'll, we'll go out to the vineyards. I'm, 
I'm up here in Sonoma County, uh, which is in Northern California. It's an hour north of San Francisco. And we, we grow grapes and, and we make wine. And then uh, we drink it. And that, that's basically, and then we, we work some too. Uh, so here's a shot. It's, it's, it's an okay shot, right? I wanted to take a shot of grapes. And uh, I got, you know, fairly close. I was somewhat happy with my closeness. But then, in the back of my head, I heard that old photography teacher say, and then get closer. So this next slide that will be coming up right now is the slide of getting closer. And you can see, and hopefully it's coming up on your, your computer right now, you can see the difference between the first shot where you're just sort of back a few feet, and then the second shot where you get in really tight, really tight. Now, how do you do this? How do you get in, you know, really tight? Well, every digital camera has this wonderful little function, and it's called close-up mode. And you can look for it. And the nice thing, there's good news and bad news with this. The good news is that the icon is fairly universal on all cameras. It's usually the picture of a flower. And I guess that's because when we think of close-up photography, a lot of times we think of pretty shots of flowers, which I love to do all the time. So that's the good news, is that here's the icon. The bad news is it could be located anywhere on your camera. And when I, when I teach photography, and this is even true uh, if you um, start using the Digital Photography Companion the book, is that that is a great tool for learning uh, photography, but you still need your manual. You will always need your owner's manual. And if you, if you don't know where it is right now, uh, either try to find it, or the good news is that almost every cam camera manufacturer that I know uh, makes it available online via PDF, and you can download it. And the thing that's cool about the PDF versions of your camera manual is that you can search. You know, instead of trying to you know, uh, flip through you know, four different languages to, to find you know, close-up mode, you can just open the PDF use the search box, search on close-up, and it will show you all the instances where that shows up in your camera manual. So anyway, so you have to find close-up mode. Now, a lot of times you can get as close as just a few inches. Okay, so there's, that's the, the macro photography. But there's also just getting closer to life in general. Now, we have another shot coming up on the screen here. And this is just the shot of ropes uh, at a cruise ship that, that's docked. And, you know, ropes, ropes are cool. By the way, these cruise ships spend like $100,000 on these ropes here. I mean, they're, they're really expensive stuff. So you never want to be in a situation if you're, if you ever become captain of a cruise ship, one of the last things you want to order is, you know, to, to cut the ropes if there's a problem because that's a very expensive thing. Okay, again, a nice shot. There's some color there and so forth. But then, Again, in the back of your mind, think, can I get closer? Is there another angle? Is there another way that I can record the shot? Now, the process that I usually go through when I'm doing this is that when I first see a shot, I take it. You know, because there's a chance that things could change. So you do want to take the shot when you first see it. Then what you want to do is, if you have time, if you have the ability, then try to work the shot. Try to work the shot after, after you've taken the first shot. So for instance, right now we have a picture coming up. I saw this while I was waiting for a cable car uh, in San Francisco. And it was a, a dad with his daughter, and she, she was having a great time. And you, know, you can tell that she's obviously affectionate uh, toward her dad, and, and he was totally into it. So it was a nice moment. So I took the first shot. But then the thing, again, Try to find a way to get closer. Try to find a way. Sometimes it means just stepping a little to the, in this case, stepping a little bit to the right and find another shot. And a lot of times that second shot, that will be the shot that you want. That will be the best shot. So first get close, get your shot, and then get closer. Now here's one of my favorite examples of that. And you're going to have a shot coming up on your screen here in a minute of uh, two sea otters. And uh, these sea otters, uh, I saw them at the uh, Vancouver Aquarium up in Vancouver, British Columbia, a, a lovely place to visit. And I tell you, if you're a photographer 
and uh, you've never had a chance to go to, to BC, uh, I would put that on your list. It's a, a nice combination of city life and outdoor life. Uh, so at this aquarium, these two otters were swimming on their back, and if you look closely, you will see that they are holding paws. Now this is, this is just adorable. They're holding paws, they've got their little eyes closed, and they're floating together on their back. I mean, it, it really doesn't get much cuter than that. So I was standing there, and I, I watched them, and I took the first shot, like I said here, you know, you want to get that first shot, and then I watched other people come up, take a shot, and then dash off to the next thing. Take a shot, dash off to the next thing. There's, um, just as a little aside, there's a, a, an anecdote that I tell sometimes. If there's the first Chevy Chase movie called uh, Vacation, I believe. He went to the Grand Canyon, and he went through all this stuff to get to the Grand Canyon, and they finally drove up to the Grand Canyon itself, and he walks out and takes a look at it, and he says, okay, that's nice, and then everyone back in the car, and they take off. And, and, and I sometimes feel like the people sort of do that. So what I did was I just hung around just for another couple minutes, and I just watched them as they floated around. I moved my position a little bit, and then the second shot that I got, the get-closer shot, was this one here. And as you can tell, it, you probably would have been happy with the other shot unless you had this shot. And this shot, to me, has so much more impact. So remember, you know, first take the shot, get close, and then try to get closer. Now, this also applies to people. And in children in particular, I think children do great when you get close because, well, they're young. They don't have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 years old, so, you know, getting close on me isn't quite as much fun as it used to be. But although I still, I still recommend it for photography, but children, of course, are just a joy to shoot close. But the thing that a lot of people forget is that you've got to get down to kid level. You've got to be down where the children are. You can't stand up, you know, be comfortable, and get close all at the same time. Sometimes you've got to get, you know, you got to get your knees dirty a little bit. So on children, remember, not only get close, but get down to kid level. Get down to where you're at eye level. If you do that and if you get close, I promise you, you'll be rewarded great shots. Okay, tip number one. I, ha I know I have it seared into your brain. Get close, and then you will hear my voice from now on. As soon as you get close, you will hear my voice say, yes, and get closer. Next tip, shoot at, this is a really, really fun one, and a, lot, uh, and a tip that a lot of people don't do. And again, with digital cameras, shooting at night and at twilight is really easy because they handle this sort of lighting exceptionally well, exceptionally well. Now, the biggest problem with shooting at night in twilight is just thinking about doing it, just being aware of, hey, I want to shoot at this time of day. A lot of times when we're traveling and we have the opportunity to shoot at night in twilight, we're doing what? Eating dinner. We're eating dinner. <laughs> so there we are in some, you know, some restaurants, you know, uh, you know, having our meal and stuff, while outside, you know, the, the world is just, you know, putting on this show for us that we're missing. And now you'll notice in this shot here, and this is in taken in Manhattan, of course, uh, that this is what I call one of the magic moments of the day. And there, this, there's a window of about 15, 20 minutes, sometimes even uh, half an hour, where there will be color in the sky and the city lights go on, and a lot of times car lights go on too. Now, this shot with, uh, uh, with color in the sky, I think is far more interesting than the shot against the black sky. Now, the shot against the black sky is still good, but the shot with color in the sky, to me, uh, has a little bit more oomph. So if you can, let's say that you're traveling, and you, want, and you want to take some of these shots. The first day that you're wherever you are, pay attention to what time of day this happens. Now here's a, a shot of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, during this time of day, we have car lights on, we have uh, the, the street lights are on here, up here, and we have color in the sky. I mean, this is, this is like photography heaven right now. So pay attention as to when that's happening. And then make a note of it, and then the next night, plan on being somewhere with your camera ready when this happens. Now, even as you get a little bit later uh, and you start to get that, that inky blue color, you can still get some really nice shots. This shot was taken, 
Okay. Uh, does anyone know where the shot was taken? Las Vegas. Yes, I saw you right there in the front row. Say Las Vegas. Absolutely. This is. And here's here's the next thing. Where was it taken in Las Vegas? Okay. And you're thinking the stratosphere. That's right. At the end of the strip, uh, you know, on your way to uh, downtown, there's a there's a stratosphere there, and you can go up there, and with your camera, and hang out and wait for the, the magic moment of the day and get shots like this. It, it's really a lot of fun. Now, the one thing I'll tell you about technique, here's, here's how you do this shot. Okay, now, this part, if you're, if you're not going to write the book or, or uh, transcribe this, this presentation, you might want to make a note, a mental note on this, because there's a couple steps. Step one, turn off your flash. Okay, your flash is good for about eight feet. All right, this, this, that, that means you're going to maybe shoot the railing, light up the railings. It's not good for any of this, and, but it does tell your camera to, to use different shutter speeds and so forth. So right away, just turn off your flash. You have to find your flash menu on your camera and go to flash off, step one. Step two, find a way to stabilize your camera. Now that could be setting it on uh, a table, on a ledge. If you, set, if you put it on a ledge, make sure you keep your wrist strap on, right? Okay, because, you know, like up here at the stratosphere, it can get a little breezy. And, you know, we, we don't want to have an incident with our camera. But uh, find a way to stabilize. I like to carry a little thing called a gorilla pod. And a gorilla pod is just this very light little tripod you can carry in your back pocket. And then it allows you to, to position the shot the way that you want. Do that. Then the third step, after you stabilize your camera, is put it on self-timer mode. Self-timer mode, now that's usually in the drive menu. And so that'll be with burst mode and single shot, and then usually self-timer will be there too. And the reason why you do that, even if you have your camera stabilized, when you go to push the button, right, you can jar the camera. And then that'll make your shot blur. You notice this is nice and crisp, because I use the self-timer, I push the button, then the camera waits a few seconds. And then it takes the shot when it's all stabilized. That's all you got to do. Camera will take it from there. Let me show you just a couple more of these. Now, I love shooting. This is shot through a hotel window. I love shooting through hotel windows. Uh, you can get great shots because you, you have perspective. The thing to remember, though, if you're shooting through glass, is that you have to turn off your flash, right? Because the last thing you want is your flash flashing in the glass. Say that. Uh, and then you press your camera right up against the glass. And then I usually turn off the room lights behind me, too, because by turning off the room lights behind me, then I ensure that I'm not going to get any reflection. And then you just take the shot. You might need to, uh, to raise your ISO up a little bit. From you know, Normally it will be around 100. Set it up around 400 or so, so, so your camera is a little bit more sensitive to this, this lower lighting. But by doing so, if you press your camera right up against the glass there, turn off your flash, raise your ISO a little bit, you can get great stuff. Also, the other thing, make sure you have your camera with you when you're out walking around. And uh, this is why I like compact cameras so much, because compact cameras you have with you. If I only shot with a digital SLR, I would have missed this shot right here, the Chrysler building, in the fog, because I would have left my DSLR back at the hotel room. I was just going out to have a bite to eat. But because I had a compact camera with me, I was able to, to grab the shot when I saw it. And by the way, I recorded this with a Canon G9, which for those of you that want a compact, but you want you know raw and all the controls, that it's a beautiful camera. But, uh, but whatever camera you have, you can get good shots at night. So shoot at twilight, shoot at night. Uh, Note when, when the magic moment of the day happens, and then put yourself in a position to get a good shot. That's number two. Number three, black and white. There's something, there's something about black and white that we just love. We love black and white. I think it's in our, in our genetic code now uh, from you know, uh, the historical shots that we see in Life magazine and, and newspaper clippings and, and all that sort of stuff. People love looking at black and white. And in digital photography, black and white is very, very easy to do. Now, the first thing that I recommend is that um, even though you can shoot in black and white with your camera, I usually don't. 
Now, I might use the black and white mode to preview a shot, but I will shoot in color. And the reason being is because it's very easy to convert to black and white on your computer. And then that way, you have both the color shot and the black and white shot. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. here. Here's a building shot in San Francisco through a hotel window, right? So you're starting to, to catch on to my MO here. It's, it's nice in color. I like it in color. But I also like it in black and white. And this is kind of fun now. What's going to happen is the black and white is just going to roll uh, down your screen and sort of replace the color shot. In, in black and white, and I'll tell you, if you make a print of this, it looks really good. And if you have a photo printer, uh, try something like a semi-gloss or, or a matte paper and, and put a, convert a shot to black and white and put it on that paper and take a look at it. And then another tip, too, is that I do a little extra sharpening uh, for black and white uh, on these types of shots because I think that that little extra crispness uh, really comes through uh, when you make a print. All right, so now you're going to have another shot rolling onto your screen here, another San Francisco shot, uh, another shot shot through a hotel window. Uh, again, interesting. There's, some of the colors are sort of fun. you got a nice blue sky, you know, all that good stuff. But I'm going to go to black and white now. Let's take a look at it in black and white. In black and white, suddenly it's like the San Francisco that we knew when we looked at uh, newspaper clippings or saw Life magazine shots. It, I know suddenly it goes from San Francisco of, in this case, 2007 to a timeless sort of San Francisco that could be, you know, any time. And uh, especially buildings like New York, I mean, um, cities like New York and San Francisco that have uh, architecture, that Chicago, that spans, uh, you know, uh, uh, many different architectural times. Uh, black and white really resonates well. Now, the other thing you can do also is, um, and I'm going to give you another example, is uh, create sepia or toned black and white versions or duotones. And again, this is really easy to do on the computer. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll show you right now in iPhoto uh, a little bit how this works. Uh, I'll just go to edit mode. Click down here to edit mode. And in iPhoto, and this, by the way, this works with Photoshop Elements, this works with Photoshop CS3, this works in Aperture, this works in Lightroom, this works probably in, you know, whatever uh, photo application you have, there will be something like this. I just happen to have iPhoto up right now. In iPhoto, you have a shot, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to send you back to the color right now because I don't need to to make this point. I just go into edit mode and then I click on thing called the effects palette, and I have all of these options right here, black and white, sepia, antique. You can fade the color, and then you can always go back to, to the original that you want. And a lot of times what I will do when I'm doing this technique is I'll have the color shot, the same working in iPhoto, I'll duplicate it, make another version of it, and then I will I'll play with it and apply my effects. It's, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, we'll click out of it here, and it's really, really easy. Now let me, also, don't forget about black and white for portraits. I think that people shots in black and white uh, can be very, very compelling. And then sometimes you can just have fun. Uh, uh, coming up on your screen here in a second will be a shot of Elvis on Hollywood Boulevard with an old-fashioned Coke bottle behind him fun shot, you know, just kind of a grab shot walking with my compact camera, but then I wanted to see, maybe this would be more fun in black and white. You might even change your mind. There might be one day where you say, you know what, I want to use the color shot, and there might be another day for something else where you say, I want to use the black and white shot. You know, thanks to digital photography, this is easy to do, and you can have both, both just sitting there in your photo management application. So that's convert to black and white. I just want to mention that I think, this is tip number four now, one of the easiest ways to, to change your photography, and I think to make your photography better, is to learn how to control your flash. I think uh, people just, they tend to, to leave their flash on auto mode, and, and they never really take control of it. And here's an example right here. You're going to have a photo coming up on your screen of a couple 
uh, sitting in a park. Now, the way that most people would, would shoot the shot, their flash would be in auto mode. Now, the, the, the camera would look at the scene and go, you know what, there's lots of light here. You know, I don't need to go on. I don't need to turn the flash on because there's plenty of light. Well, yeah, there's plenty of light, but it's not necessarily the right light for what's really important to you, which are the people, right? So in this shot here, the way that I took it is that I turned on the flash. So I had to find the flash menu, and then you go to flash on. And the way that the flash menus work on almost every camera is just you just find the little lightning bolt, uh, and then you cycle through it, and there'll be flash on, flash off, auto red eye, yada, yada, yada. For your people shots, outdoors, try this. You have to promise me you'll try this. Go find us, find some people, go to a party, do something, whatever, do candidates. Put them in a pretty setting, turn on your flash, get within eight feet, and take a bunch of pictures. And then tell me what you think. I, it, it, changes, it changes the shot altogether, because your camera will balance out everything else. It'll balance out the background and everything, but what it does is, is that it illuminates your subject, and then it matches it with the environment. And it has a very, very nice uh, appeal. Now, wedding photographers do this a lot. And they'll, they'll use flash both indoors and out, because you know what, what brides want, they want they want to look good, right? It's their wedding day. Grooms want this too. But a lot of times, you know, the, the bride will be the person that you're working most closely with. And this includes, if you're a guest and you just want to have some nice shots to give to them as, as a remembrance. So they're not interested a lot of times in, in very artistic stuff. And for instance, if the light's coming in from the side, lighting them, and you don't have your flash on, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what that means. Light from the side uh, accentuates texture. Light from the front downplays texture. Now, now just think about that for a second when you think about people. What do most people want? Most people don't want a lot of texture in their face when you take a shot. So light from the front a lot of times is a good light for people. And what's the easiest way to get light from your front? Turn on the flash, okay? You could have the sun glaring in their eyes, but you know a lot of folks just don't really appreciate that. Turning on the flash is just a much easier way to go. Now you have another setting on your camera, and you're gonna have a shot coming up on your screen here in a minute, and sometimes you, you need to use the flash indoors, but you don't want the background to go to black. You want to have some ambiance. This, this shot here is a shot of the San Francisco twins. They're, they're very famous sisters in the city, and uh, I was eating at the Cheesecake Factory one night, and I saw them uh, you know, having a bite to eat, and I went over and said, may I take your picture? You guys just look smashing tonight. It just look beautiful. And of course, you know, they're, they're very nice, and they said yes. So I stood them up, and but I didn't want the background to be black. I wanted to have some color back here. So another mode when you're going through your flash cycle is look for slow synchro flash. This is the mode that will, where the camera will slow down the shutter speed and try to capture some of this information in the background, but yet turn on the flash so that you can get exposure on your subject. It, it keeps that background from going completely black. So here are, here, coming up on your screen now, you'll get to see uh, what you want to look for. Night portrait, right here. And sometimes it's called slow synchro, sometimes it's called night portrait. And by the way, flash off. Flash off. Sometimes you want it, sometimes in, even indoors, you want to turn off the flash. Here's an example of bounce flash, where I actually uh, use a DSLR and I put a flash on the camera and I pointed the flash up at the ceiling, it was a white ceiling, and let the, the light rain down on the subject. It gives you a whole different look. It's not as harsh uh, as, as a flash pointing right at your subject. Now here's flash off. You're gonna have uh, a young woman coming up on your screen. And this is a case where there was a lot of light in the room, and I just thought that the flash would kill the shot. I thought it would sort of ruin the mood. So I turned off the flash, and I steadied the camera. I raised the ISO a little bit, up to about 400 or so, to make it a little bit uh, more light sensitive. And I took the, the shot without a flash. So you can see that, that the, your flash menu uh, suddenly becomes really important because it allows you to kind of control
control the look of your shots. And I have an example of the flash menu coming up right now. You have auto right here, which is where most people leave their flash. The tip I'll give you is that when you're done doing something special with your flash, go ahead and return it to auto. Let that be your default. But don't be afraid of these other settings, especially flash on for fill flash outdoors, flash off uh, when you want to take portraits, when you have enough light and you want to get a natural feel. And then that slow synchro flash, like I did with the San Francisco twins, where you want to capture a little ambiance in the background. Normally, I stay away from red eye reduction because I don't think it works very well. And the thing to look for now, I tell you, if you're shopping for a camera, is look for a camera that has uh, auto red eye fix. And what it does is that after the shot is taken, then it fixes the red eye. And then you can just go ahead and shoot normally. Red eye reduction modes tend not to work very well. Okay, I have just a few more minutes, and I just want to tell you about one more tip that I think is really important for getting natural looking portraits called burst mode. Or a lot of times uh, on your camera, it will be called continuous mode. Both work. Now, this is in the drive mode. So if you go to the drive mode button, which is where self timer also hangs out, uh, a lot of times you'll find continuous or burst mode. And the reason why I like it is here's the way a lot of people take people shots. They'll go, okay, they'll line up the shot. And you've got this thing coming up on your screen right now. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to take the shot now. Are you, are you, okay, you ready? You know? And, uh, you know, and then we manage to, like, to suck the life out of the subject. <laughs> you know, right at the moment, uh, we actually take the picture. And so one way around this is to go to continuous mode or burst mode. Now, this is an instance where you would turn off the flash, right? And you, you, so you would try to find a nice lighting uh, and then turn off the flash. The reason being because your flash usually can't keep up with the two, 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 two firing of the frames in burst mode. Burst mode on a compact camera can be like a one frame per second, all the way up to on a digital SLR, it can be you know seven or eight frames per second. So flashes usually can't keep up with that. But look, here's the same person. Now look what comes up on your screen when I go to burst mode, and I'm just interacting with her. I'm just talking to her and uh, taking pictures in burst mode while I'm doing that. And suddenly, this person looks alive. She looks alive. Now, in, I, I guarantee you, in a sequence of 20 or 30 shots that you take using this technique, you're going to have one shot in there that both you like and the subject's going to like. I, I absolutely guarantee it. It always, it always happens. Burst mode is, is just magic for, for capturing the essence or the life of a person. And the thing that you look for is that you just look for this little kind of continuous icon here. And in drive mode, that's what you want to set. Turn off your flash. Make sure that your flash is off. You notice that up here, see I have the little flash off. No, no flash because, again, it can't keep up with the continuous mode. And then just shoot. Just shoot. Now, here's a case where, where burst mode sort of helped me because the very first frame we had a, a little bit of a hair problem here. This, this hair was coming down into her eyes right here, but I was shooting in burst mode. It was a little breezy. So as we go through the sequence here, you notice that the hair moves out of her expression. Now, I was shooting this with a digital SLR, so I was going at a pretty, pretty fast clip, and that's why her, her face hasn't changed that much because you, this happens so quickly. But you notice here burst mode saved me because of these little things, these little variables that can happen during the shoot, uh, sometimes will correct themselves during the sequence. And then the other thing about burst mode uh, that, that I think is helpful is that if you do exposure bracketing, I think it's a lot more fun to do it with burst mode. And exposure bracketing is, of course, where you take one shot at the normal exposure, what your camera says, one shot underexposed, called auto bracketing, and then one shot overexposed. If you go to burst mode, then all you have to do is line up your shot, hold down the button, and this go boop, boop, and it'll go do 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 do, and it will take all three shots for you, just like that, in about the time that you normally would take one shot. So that's another use of burst mode that I think is really, really helpful. I just have one bonus tip for you. I know I'm out of time, and I want to
to take some questions, but I just have one bonus tip for you. In that, if you want to get the big picture when you're traveling, I only have three words for you. Stitch stuff together. There's this mode on your camera called panorama mode. And what it allows you to do is take a sequence of shots. In this case, I always move from left to right, overlapping a little bit, and then when you get back on your computer, you can stitch them together. And instead of having just a very narrow view of something beautiful like this, the sunset in Mexico, you can have a shot that represents what you felt. Because a lot of times when you just take one frame, even a wide-angle lens, it's like looking at the sunset through a toilet paper tube. It just doesn't have the impact. This is four shots stitched together, and it gives you a much broader feel. So that's your bonus tip. Stitch stuff together and see what you get. Now, again, all of this stuff I want to mention is in the Digital Photography Companion, which is available at O'Reilly.com, and there's lots of other crazy stuff. You notice that over here in the side, this is my, my teaching uh, iPhoto. You notice that I have all this kind of, all these other goodies over here. All that stuff's covered uh, in the book. It's a lot of fun. It's available now. So I think we want to take some questions here. And uh, we have some folks that have been uh, chatting in some questions. I'll read the first one to you. Would you use the close-up function if you had a macro lens on a digital SLR? So this is a situation, uh, you know, the nice thing is about digital SLRs is that you can remove the lenses and put on other lenses. Most of the time with a digital SLR, if you have a macro lens on there, a lens that's designed specifically for close-up photography, you can just shoot in regular mode because the, the lens itself, the optics itself, will help you. Now, there is something, uh, a lot of times you'll have a, a scene mode or they call it a, a specialty mode. Uh, for close-up photography, and that is helpful even when you have uh, you, uh, when you have a macro lens on there because it sets some of the camera settings uh, for you that optimizes, allows you to get the most out of that lens. It, it might stop down the aperture a little bit to give you a little bit more depth of field, and it might uh, change the metering pattern to, to more uh, focused in the center, things like that. So it, it's not a bad way to go. I like those, um, those specialty modes. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll have a portrait one, you'll have a close-up one, you'll have a sports one. Those, those work well. And if you have a good macro lens and you go to that specialty mode, pretty nice stuff. If you forget and just shoot in regular program mode, you'll probably get good shots too. Okay, now here's a good question. This is, this is the one that I like. What kind of camera do you use? All right, first I have to take a deep breath and say, uh, obviously you're not thinking that I only use one camera, right? You know, you know that that would just be insane. I, 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 I mean, I'm obligated to use as many cameras as I possibly can. But uh, so I use for my, for my digital SLR work, I like to shoot with a Canon 5D. It's a full frame sensor. It's reasonably priced uh, for you know, a camera of this caliber. And uh, it, it just takes beautiful shots. So I use a Canon 5D for my digital SLR. I do have a Rebel. I do have a Canon Rebel that I like a lot. And uh, I think it takes excellent shots. And sometimes I'll carry it when I want a little lighter digital SLR. And then I, I am shooting with a couple compacts right now uh, for my, my super small compact that I can just put in my back pocket. I'm shooting with a Sony uh, T200. It's cute. It's just an adorable little camera. And it takes uh, pretty good shots. Uh, uh, 8 megapixels. Uh, it's, it's a lovely camera. I, I like it a lot. And then uh, for a little bigger compact, I shoot with a Canon G9. So there's, those, are my, those are my main cameras right now. But uh, I must confess, I have a few other ones uh, stashed away also. Okay, now uh, I have another question here. Do you use a tripod for your night shots? If not, how do you keep your camera steady? This is a great question, I think. Most of the time, if I can, I will use a tripod when shooting at night because uh, I think, you know, the, the, the more you can steady your camera, especially when you're shooting with a compact, it allows you to keep your ISO setting down low. So, for instance, if I'm, if I'm going, let's go to a night shot here. We'll find you one. Pull one up on the screen. So, 
you know that this, this shot that's coming up on the screen is nice and sharp, and I did use uh, a tripod for it, uh, and it allows me also to keep that ISO setting down, right? Because if my camera's on a tripod, then I can have a longer exposure, and it's a lot easier to control image noise. You notice there's, there's not very much image noise up here in the sky. Now, the problem is if you don't shoot uh, with a tripod at night or at twilight, then you're forced a lot of times to raise your ISO up to 400 or 800 or 1600, depending on the setting. And depending on your camera, you can get a lot more image noise. And it actually, I think uh, a shot that I have here, the shot here coming up uh, that I shot uh, at twilight was with a compact camera. I did not, the shot that's coming up on your screen right now, I did not have a tripod with me at that moment. And so that you'll notice, and let me see if I can uh, zoom in a little bit. out on, I forgot how to go to a, it should be just command one, but it's not working at the moment. Uh, if you go to the sky, you'll see that uh, I do have some image noise there because I was forced to raise that ISO up to about 400 on a compact camera. So you will get some, there's always that trade-off. So if I can, I love to use a tripod for night shooting, but believe me, if I don't have one with me, I'm going to take the shot anyway. Because I, in the end, I think it's more important to come away with a shot and try to figure it out later than pass on the shot just because you don't have exactly what you want to have with you at that moment. So first first pass, and that's why I like these little gorilla pods because you can carry a tripod with you in your back pocket. Uh, next uh, question, can you slow sync flash, for instance, uh, like with the San Francisco twins, with a digital SLR? And what are the settings to get that effect? Yes, you can. And in fact, a lot of digital SLRs will have one of those specialty modes and a lot of times they'll call it night portrait, or they'll call it uh, night setting. Uh, you know, it, it varies from camera to camera, but a, a, a lot of times I'll see it in there with sports and portraits and uh, those other specialty settings, and it works great on a digital SLR. It works fabulous. And in fact, if you have a digital SLR and you try using that, because you can get away with raising your ISO up a little bit more, um, you can put your ISO on 400 or 800 on your digital SLR, use the slow synchro setting, and you'll get better results than you get with a compact camera because the, the camera is more sensitive to that background uh, lighting, that ambient lighting. So yes, and it, it works great. you just have to check your camera manual to find that night portrait or night setting of uh, uh, scene mode. Next question. Does close-up mode actually shift the magnification so you can start out closer and get closer? Yeah, it does. Close-up mode on compact cameras and so forth uh, allow you, they, they basically uh, change the, the optics uh, so that you can get closer within inches of your subject and get a good shot. Now, the thing that you want to look out for on a lot of compact cameras is that they'll have regular close-up mode and then they'll have digital close-up. I tend to stay away from digital close-up the same way that I stay away from digital zoom. And the reason being is that uh, then that, ha that, that magnification is not happening with the optics. In either case, it's happening with the camera's electronics. And I think it compromises the quality uh, a little too much for my taste. But when you're using regular close-up mode, that's, that's an optical mode, and um, it works fabulous. Great. Now, uh, another question I have, and this is a fun one, is a teleconverter a reasonable alternative to a telephoto lens? It is. It is, actually. The key with teleconverters is quality. You want a quality teleconverter. Now, for those of you that haven't played with this yet, so let's say that you have a nice telephoto that you like, a 70 to 200. It takes good shots. But, you, you know, you're out shooting, let's say, your child's uh, soccer game, and you go, I'm not, I don't have quite enough reach, and I don't feel like going out and buying a new lens. A teleconverter is an optic that goes between your zoom lens and the camera that adds magnification, either 1.5 or even up to 2x doubles the magnification. And they work well. 
uh, you'll you'll lose one or two f stops of light. So you know, you, if your if your lens is an f4 and you have a 2x teleconverter, you'll get double the magnification, but your f stop your maximum aperture will move from f4 to, to 5, 6, or 8. Uh, so you know you got to make sure you're in bright light for the shooting, and probably have to raise your ISO up. But you can get good shots. You have to keep in mind, though that whenever you increase magnification, you have to hold the camera more steady. You have to shoot at a faster shutter speed. For instance, if you're shooting with your 200 millimeter lens, you can get away with a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second. Fine. You double that 200 to 400 uh, millimeters with a teleconverter, you've got to increase your shutter speed up to 1 500th of a second or so. And a lot of people say, you know, I get terrible results with the teleconverter. Well, actually, it's not all the teleconverter's fault. Sometimes it's they're not adjusting their technique for the equipment that they're using. That being said, do try to get a good quality teleconverter. And if you can get one that's matched for your lens, all the better. What's a good 1600 ISO camera these days? Uh, any DSLR these days shoots pretty darn good. At 1600. If you're a Nikon fan, uh, I'll tell you the new D300 shoots great at 1600. It is a fabulous DSLR at 1600. Uh, the Nikon D3 is too, but of course, you know, then you're laying out big bucks, thousands of dollars. Whereas uh, the D3 is a uh, D300 is a much more affordable camera. It shoots fabulous. On the Canon side, uh, both the Canon uh, 40D uh, and the uh, Canon 5D shoot great at those ISOs. You'll get excellent results. And at the entry level, even, uh, the, the, there's a new Canon Digital Rebel coming out. It's called the XSI. Uh, I think it's going to be shipping here uh, within a few weeks. Uh, it's, it's an entry level camera that will shoot very good at those ISOs. But the fact of the matter, almost any DSLR shoots better at 1600 than almost any compact camera. And that's mainly because its sensor is bigger, it has more light gathering power, uh, it generates less heat uh, at those higher ISOs, and heat in uh, digital photography means image noise. So any DSLR is good, but if, you, if you're looking to, to buy a camera right now, uh, these new cameras that I mentioned, the Canon XSI, the Nikon D300, or uh, Canon 5D, beautiful stuff. I have time for two more questions. Okay, three questions, so I'll try to, to motor through them. So if, uh, <clears throat> if you're waiting for that, uh, if you have a lot of coffee and you're starting to get a little antsy, I'll try to keep things moving here. Uh, next question, is there anything faster than 1600? I used to love pushing black and white film to 6400 even. Yeah, there is. Uh, um, you can go up on a lot of uh, digital SLRs. They'll have a high ISO mode that will allow you to go to 3200. And on the new Nikons, uh, the D300 and the D3, they allow you to go to some astronomical number that I can't even remember right now because it's so high. So, uh, yes, you can go uh, beyond 1600. You usually have to go into a special mode to access that. And if you check your camera specifications, if you have a digital SLR, chances are you'll find it there. And it is fun. You're right. Sometimes that grain, you know, that image noise of those high ISOs uh, actually contribute to, to the artistic aspect of the shot. Next question. Should you leave noise reduction on at all the time or only for high ISO settings? Um, I think, uh, I don't think for most cameras that it will even kick in at the lower ISO settings. So I don't see a problem with leaving it on all the time. Uh, I, I guess the good news about leaving it on all the time is then you won't forget when you're at a high ISO setting to, to turn it on. Uh, noise reduction, uh, some cameras will have it as a, as a special setting in the menu items. Uh, and uh, we see it more on digital SLRs, but we're seeing it on compacts uh, these days too. So I think it's fine just to leave it on. Uh, I think for most cameras, it will only kick in when the camera needs it. Uh, the only downside to it is that it will increase the processing time of that image a little bit uh, as the camera works on that image to reduce that noise. Uh, and then, I 
got one more question here. Here we go. And the grand finale for today. I often, this better be good, not to put any pressure on this, uh, on this contributor here, but I often run into image fringing when I take strong contrast images, such as shooting in the sky. What is a good setting to avoid fringing? So fringing, uh, uh, in, in optical terms, a lot of times it's called chromatic aberration. It's nasty stuff. And what it could be, let's say that you take a picture of a tree branch against the bright sky, and along the edge of that tree branch, you might see like a purpley color or a cyan color. And that is an aberration. That is an, an optical defect, essentially. It doesn't mean that your lens is a bad lens. What it means is that you, you have entered into territory that's beyond what your, what your lens can reasonably handle. You see that more and more. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, I'll take that. You see that more often on compact cameras than you do on digital SLRs, although older lenses that weren't made for digital uh, SLRs will sometimes show it also. It doesn't mean you have a bad lens if you get this chromatic aberration. It just means that that lens won't perform well in that specific setting. And in Photoshop, uh, and also in Adobe Camera Raw, and a lot of other photo applications, they will actually have a setting to help you reduce chromatic aberration, uh, to sort of take that out. Sometimes, uh, even on the cover, I'll have, uh, oh, let's, let me show you this one shot here. On the cover of the Digital Photography Companion, the shot I'm pulling up right now, I shot this with a compact camera, this shot of the Transamerica building here. And uh, it, it was just a matter of I wouldn't have got the shot if, if I didn't shoot with compact. But I had a little bit of that chromatic aberration running right along here. And I got a little of the cyan uh, because I was shooting with a, a compact camera that couldn't quite handle this, this setting. So what I had to do was I went into Photoshop and uh, I magnified it to 100%. And I just used the clone tool. I cloned some of the sky and I just ran it right along the edge there to take it out. So a lot of times, again, you know, don't, never not take a shot because you know that you know you might have to deal with this thing later on. Get the shot and then deal with the, you know, deal with whatever issues you have in post production if you have to. Uh, but the main thing around chromatic aberration is that some lenses will have it, some lenses won't. And you know, if you shoot a lot in those contrasted conditions, you probably want to find which of your lenses don't have it and shoot with them then. So I think we're in good shape here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. This this is fun. This was my maiden voyage for a, a, a webinar. So uh, I, I tried to behave myself and uh, not get ahead of my pictures too much. Uh, O'Reilly is going to, uh, for those of you who signed up for this, you'll get a notice that will let you know that uh, you, you can download the presentation if you want. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Go to, if you want to find out where, what I'm up to, if you want to see one of these talks live, if you go to thedigitalstory.com, www.thedigitalstory, there's an event calendar link there, and you can see where I'm speaking. Uh, I'm going to be in Photoshop World uh, next week, I believe, in Orlando. So for those of you that hang out in that area, you might want to come by and say hi. I'll be at the O'Reilly booth. And um, you can always uh, keep up with... Uh, what we're doing here at O'Reilly at digitalmedia.oreilly.com. I've enjoyed doing this. Thanks so much uh, for stopping in and, and spending an hour with us.